but uh, I want to welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Rick Van Diepen. I'm uh, I'm an architect and a green building consultant, and I'm on the AIA board, uh, AIA Las Vegas board that is, and um, and I'm also the chair of the Las Vegas Committee on the Environment, uh, which is hosting this webinar today. Um, just a little bit of house housekeeping first. Um, this is a CEU. Um, course. So um, you should get an automatic credit for it. However, if you do have any problems, um, I'll, uh, you can contact me or Kelly Levine um, at the AI office to um, if, if you have any problems getting your CU credits. Um, at the end, um, at, at, after Tate's done his presentation, uh, we'll have a Q&A. So I'll uh, um, un unmute everybody. However, during the actual webinar, uh, everybody will automatically be on mute. So don't, don't worry about that if you have dogs barking in the background. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll stick around and ask some questions. Uh, I, think, I think Tate, uh, I really wanna thank him for his time today and, uh, and I'm looking forward to getting some feedback from everybody. So um, we'll just move forward. Um, and I'll do our introduction here. Tate Walker is the Director of Sustainability at OPN Architects in Minneapolis, and he leads uh, projects and initiatives across the firm's four offices. His experience is rooted in the architectural design process, but also includes program and project management, as well as devel the development of technical guidelines for high-performance buildings. He served many organizations, including cities and universities, the AIA Committee on the Environment, and the USGBC's Technical Advisory Group. Tate believes in the nexus between architecture, believes that the nexus between architecture and energy provides leadership opportunities for architects as creative problem solvers, particularly for those willing to stretch their practice beyond its traditional boundaries. And that's exactly what we're gonna be talking about today, um, focusing on the 2030 commitment and how we can integrate that um, in our daily practice. So I'll hand it over to you. Tate, and thank you very again. You bet. Thanks, Rick. Uh, super nice to be here. Um, I remember the last trip I took was to Las Vegas to see you guys in 2020, in like March. And uh, you were such great hosts, and uh, thanks for having me back. I'm just here to sort of inspire you to use the 2030 commitment to serve your firm. Uh, and and really share with you some of the things that it's done for us um, and, and particularly the barriers, the challenges that we face in hopes that you won't uh, stumble over them as we did. So um, before I get started, I just wanted to do a quick poll and I've got, let's see, I'm gonna share my screen here. And present. And if I could get you guys to pull out your phones <laughs> and take, um, take that QR code or go to that website and use the code. Hopefully that works. Let's get my myself. Well, as usual, uh, it's a perfect mix of awkward silence and dead air. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I took I took the poll. Oh, you are did. You gonna, are you gonna Are you gonna bring up the results? I I am. Okay. I can get my web browser to open. Okay. So. I think it, it booted me in here. And these are some of the questions from the 2030 commitment, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I do a lot of talks and I just kind of set up these questions um, because I think they're good general questions that allow us to um, Can you see that? 
No, it's just showing your QR code from what I'm seeing. Okay. I got it. There right we now. go. There, perfect. Yep. Awesome. Yeah. So the first question is, what responsibility do architects have to mitigate climate change? No responsibility, comply with codes and standards, implement as many strategies as possible, achieve net zero on every uh, carbon and energy on every project. So this is great. Um, <laughs> I like that everyone's way over to the right. Um, don't worry, this is fully anonymous. So just, you know, your honest opinion is the most important thing. Um, I think this kind of helps take the temperature of the group, you know, before we go into it. The next question is, how often do you consider the environmental impacts of project decisions in your practice? Rarely, sometimes, often, always. And it's not a trick question. I think good introspection. <laughs> you know, how often do you actually have time to sit down and and plot something out? That's a good spread. Um, if you're doing it all the time, that's that's excellent. Um, and I think what we all aspire to. So that's I think that's the best situation. Um, how often does your firm discuss the environmental impacts of project decisions with your clients? This one's a little bit harder than the last one. Um, I think doing internal studies and, and asking questions amongst your team, your colleagues, your consultants is a lot easier than bringing it up with your clients, especially if you uh, think you might know the answer already. Um, so this is a really interesting question because it dovetails into our AIA's code of ethics. And the idea with the code of ethics is that if you're an AIA member, you have a duty beyond simply licensure and the health, safety, and welfare of the public. And that duty is expressed in the code of ethics. And particularly, I think it's uh, Canon 4, which is uh, responsibility to the environment and that you're actually expected to, um, you know, talk with your clients about these things. And, and sometimes it's not, not very easy or productive, but I think, uh, you know, gauging their interest and uh, is really important on, on every project. Whether they say no or not, that's fine. And then is your firm a signatory of the 2030 commitment? Awesome. Surprisingly, a lot of people don't know. <laughs> so yes uh, is good. No, um, how can we get you there considering it, you know? Uh, What's, what's holding you back? Those are, those are the kind of questions that, um, that I think I'm, I'm here to help solve or um, get you in the right direction. So for, for us, for OPN, um, it's been probably one of the best programs that we've done. We've done a lot of different stuff. Um, it's got teeth. It's been really successful at the firm. And, and, and showed us parts about our projects that we frankly didn't even know uh, until we started tracking. So it's been super valuable for us um, in a lot of ways. And I'm just gonna share those with you. Um, a lot of firms are, are kind of pushing beyond and, and really thinking about net zero energy, net zero carbon and um, you know, what tools or strategies do you use to achieve those, those goals? There are certainly a lot out there. And I'm just curious with your familiarity of some of these uh, topics. And hopefully it works. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and you can click as many as you want. Uh, so good. 
energy benchmarking is like fundamental to the 2030 commitment. And, and I think you build, you build that, that foundation, many of these other things just come naturally. But without that foundation, uh, it's really hard to get into accurate um, metered energy use tracking, um, net zero energy is certainly not possible <laughs> without understanding the benchmark and, and, and going for it. Uh, monitoring based commissioning. This is really interesting and it's, I would say, not very new, but in, in terms of commissioning, it is newer. Um, and I think it's a really good space for architects to be in. Uh, it doesn't involve complex models, but actually going out to the site and uh, tracking end use on a lot of different systems and reading the meters and just being like uh, physically interacting with the building. Uh, so it's not overly technical, but you know, tends to tell you more about what's going on in the building than, than an energy model. So for us, it's been super effective, low cost way of giving, you know, the project a little bit more value. Um, so that's great. And then it looks like there's some familiarity with design excellence and the super spreadsheet and some of the other tools out there. Awesome. So that, that really kind of helps me build an understanding of you all. And, and that's the most important part. Uh, Cool, let's see. My slide share broke. All right. Um, I'm gonna fly through these slides and then we're gonna have a great conversation about what you guys are experiencing and, and hopefully this will kind of inspire you to dig in if you haven't already. Um, but this is our mission statement. We're OPN architects and we want to unite and inspire folks so that we elevate the human experience. So that's really what drives us. And I don't know why I can't advance the slides. Right, so we're about 105 in four studios, actually five now. Uh, I'm in the process of opening a studio in Minneapolis up here, so pretty excited about that. Um, and then we do work mostly regionally, but all over the country and going pretty fast. Um, we've been signatories for the 2030 commitment for eight years. And it's just interesting to look back at what we were doing eight years ago and what we're doing now. And even though the industry has changed a lot, I think it's still super relevant to practice. And that's kind of reflected in the numbers for participation. It's basically doubled since 2020 um, in terms of like participating firms. So we are having um, a challenge in that some firms that have been doing it for a while are uh, sort of topping out and, and they find it hard to kind of work beyond, um, you know, these increasingly stringent goals, right? Uh, so how do we do that? And then the firms that are just beginning, uh, they need to be brought up to speed and like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is how you do it. And, and they need almost like the 101 level course on, on how to do it. So um, we're just a small working group and trying to get the word out there and, and think about uh, how best to grow the program and, and really share uh, what we're doing. So uh, design is a big driver at our firm. We certainly go after um, a lot of awards. Um, we're generalists. We do everything from, you know, a little public golf club course uh, to um, really big performance venues and everything in between. Uh, so it's a really fun place to work. But, um, you know, knowing your audience, knowing how to work with the firm, what your firm cares about is, uh, really important. Um, I think when it was by itself uh, as an initiative, it was hard to generate support. Um, but when we integrated into the firm operations and into the design conversation, that was really when it took off and, and gained a lot more widespread uh, 
purchase. Um, so one of the things we do is we use the AIA's framework for design excellence. And we just have this really uh, simple design excellence process. And what it is, is it's very light touch, once in concept and then once in DDs. And it's like a 60 to 90 minute pinup session where we have some of the firm's best design leaders and uh, performance experts to uh, walk through the design with the team. And they give a quick presentation for like 10 minutes. And then they supplement it with uh, the Common App or uh, their benchmarking studies or some of the sort of strategies and tactics that they're pursuing. And this really helps them get off on the, on the right foot in the concept phase and gets these sort of ideas in front of the client and then helps make sure they're integrated in the project as it goes forward. Because I think it's really easy to come up with a bunch of big ideas and pre-design, uh, but it's really hard to get them integrated and into the final project without being, being DE'd out. And, and so we've developed some tools like the G sheet, which I'll talk about a little bit later um, for, for how to do that. So this is some of our work on the boards, uh, just all over the place um, in terms of scope and scale. Um, and again, thinking about how to apply a program to all these different building types. <laughs> it, it's sort of, um, it's real challenging. Um, you wouldn't measure a, a steam energy plant the way you would a multifamily building or a university campus or a developer building. So it's it's really hard to develop a good program of teeth that addresses all of these things. But that's what 2030 does. Um, one of the things we do is we bring in uh, design critics uh, every year. And uh, this year we brought in Julie Snow to talk with us. And she was great. She gave a quick presentation on what she's working on, what she cares about, helps elevate the conversation and, and our sort of common language around design, but then she'll critique our projects as well. So we'll give her, you know, five or 10 projects and she'll walk through them and give her, us her honest opinion. And this has been great for, um, you know, encouraging design and performance alongside one another. And every year we get better and better. And it's fun when, when we find like a theme uh, from one sort of reviewer to the next. So uh, she was great. I think, you know, we gave her an honorarium and she turned around and gave it right to NOMA, the local chapter of uh, um, NOMA. So that was, that was really special for us. Um, when we talk about design, uh, we talk about it in as broad a context as possible. And that's true for sustainability as well. Um, so that's where the framework fits in. And when you think about these different categories and how they apply uh, to, to our projects, you know, you can really personalize them and they can see themselves, your client can see themselves in this framework. Uh, and that, that's really important um, because it's not overly technical, uh, but that's good. They, they can approach it, they can contribute to it, they, they can understand it. And then we can translate it into uh, metrics that can then support lead or um, living building challenge or, or, or whatever they, that's on the table. So that's, that's been really great. At, the other thing that's different about the framework, I think, is it starts with good design right? And um, no other rating system really has that at its core. So that's been, that's been really important. Um, another thing that sticks out is uh, design for economy. And it's something that we do every day in our jobs, but something that's like rarely captured in a rating system. And there's a really nice synergy between the design for economy measure and design for energy. So those, those sort of mutually support each other and uh, they add some depth and richness to, to our work. Um, one of the things that really has taken off to my surprise, uh, 
has been to rank ourselves uh, against the framework for design excellence. Like, okay, what are we doing well? What are we not doing so well on it? What are we gonna work on this year? And ask ourselves a lot of hard questions and then rate ourselves. So in this case, um, you know, we're, we're sitting pretty, <laughs> we're probably a little hard on ourselves, but um, we've gotten some national recognition this last year in, from design awards. Uh, from some different areas. And, and so we feel like we're a little better than we were last year. So we're adding a bar. Um, in design for ecology, for example, maybe um, I, think, I think the case was like, <laughs> it's very hard to quantify. It's one of the squishier metrics, but it's something that maybe we were too generous on ourselves last year. Um, Design for water, you know, have, have we been consistently tracking water? No. Um, have we been, you know, doing some innovative stormwater practices? Maybe not as much as we would like to. There, there are a few big projects, but consistently, you know, it's, uh, it's not sticking out. And in the Midwest, that's a huge driver for us. So, um, you know, when it comes to design for energy, 2030 is a big part of that uh, calculation. Uh, are we, you know, do we have net zero projects that are complete? Do we have work on the boards that are tracking net zero? Uh, what are some other sort of innovative energy features that we're, we're investigating? So those are really cool. Um, there's a ton of growth in design for wellness. It's probably the fastest growing. Um, it's, you know, slated to be like a tr the first, the next trillion dollar business opportunity, according to McKinstry. So there's obviously a lot of room to grow there. I mean, well is new to the system. It's probably only five, six years old. Um, so it's, it's on, it's, it's really, really growing fast. And then of course, COVID is only sort of, um, uh, sped things up for us. Um, I sort of mentioned the G sheet earlier, and I think one of the great things about the 2030 commitment is the DDX or design data exchange and actually tracking your data all in one place. So you can kind of contrast and compare projects and figure out themes and uh, really sort of hone in on, on what the optimized situation is. But, you know, we find a lot of value in um, communicating these strategies in the drawing set. So if you think about it, whenever you look at a project that's a few years old and you're looking for information, the first place you always look is the drawing set. And it's the hardest place to find any sustainability metrics. Right, so how do we communicate those metrics, not only to the owner, but to the um, consultants that we work with, to the contractor that uh, is maybe on board with us at the beginning or towards the um, end of the project in a design bid build scenario. So um, actually writing it down and communicating it in diagrams and graphs, um, and, and tying it to a lot of our design decisions throughout the process has been really important. So you can see like an EUI graph up there at the top, uh, window to wall ratio is something that architects control and can really influence in terms of performance. Uh, uh, we're looking at uh, carbon density, we're looking at daylighting, uh, you know, forcing teams to think about sustainability in a visual way and not just uh, uh, off on some server that's not connected to the project. <laughs> that's been real successful for us. And it's really cool to see, um, you know, design teams kind of go through this process and end up creating stuff along the way that, uh, that really informs future projects. So that's a cool part. Um, and then finally, I've had a lot of success 
um, selling this to clients. And one of the recent um, sort of victories, if you will, uh, has been with the state of Wisconsin, where every um, state funded project has to go through the framework for design excellence. Um, so if your clients are asking for it, <laughs> I mean, there's no reason you shouldn't be using it. <laughs> and, and that's really the hiccup, I think, in practice, right? So once our clients demand it, it's really easy for us to figure it out. You know, all the excuses get tossed aside and, and we just focus on getting it done. So this has been really successful. Um, I don't think it's a sort of replacement for lead or anything like that. Um, I, I think that it goes alongside of it. Um, it helps establish the vision and then the metrics come, come along soon after. Um, but everybody can kind of get involved in this visionary component. And then, gosh, what is wrong with my screen? And then I'm doing the same for uh, um, Governor Walt's uh, Climate Action Framework for Minnesota right now. So um, these ideas are gaining a lot of traction in you know, the Midwest right now, which has typically been pretty conservative. And uh, I don't know, it, it's really kind of surprising and exciting for me uh, and, and just important to get out there and not let your foot off the gas. These are, <laughs> these are relevant ideas, their time is here. And, and if you thought they didn't work in the past, you should definitely try them again. Right? <laughs> so that's just like a quick sort of intro um, to some of these things. Um, and then I'll go through a couple of projects and some tools and processes. So hopefully you're all still with me on a Tuesday night. <laughs> all right, thanks. Uh, so this is a really simple building. It's like a, it's like a boathouse. Um, it's pretty small. Uh, it is for the city of West Des Moines. Um, but I think it's the perfect sort of test bed for a net zero project. So really easy to get your arms around. The downside is like we didn't have any specialized consultants. They didn't come to the project with uh, like a demand for it to be net zero. We sort of like just did our best practices. We did them in house. We didn't have a modeling consultant uh, or anything like that. We were kind of working off the back of the envelope calculations and a really good engineer that was involved. And we were able to sort of say, hey, you guys are right on the cusp of net zero. You should really push for it. And, and they went for it, which was cool. Um, so talking about you know, how the building fits in with the landscape and how it uh, connects to a greater watershed and ecosystem and certainly works with some of the city's other uh, infrastructure. Uh, it's, it's really exciting for a town like uh, West Des Moines that's you know, never even considered lead uh, for a project to, to be kind of looking into this and testing it on a building. So um, yeah, just a couple of quick early sketches. Um, thinking about how to close the gap between uh, how much it's gonna cost and, and how, how close we can get to net zero. Um, I think one of the lessons that we learned at, about this was, was really the, um, the owner tenant split um, where the tenant just wants to sell ice cream out of the uh, boathouse um, and, and, you know, wants to find a fridge for 60 bucks on Craigslist um, rather than <laughs> actually, you know, being worried about if we're going to meet net zero or not. So those plug loads are really important. And so it's, it's hard to write these things into the lease, but just having that conversation with a client and, you know, thinking about how this fridge is 
worth you know six thousand dollars worth of solar panels you know <laughs> what can we do to sort of close this gap um so it's again it's discovering these things along the way and then trying to recognize them um this is our oh shit moment um you know we had sort of this back envelope uh sort of forecast uh for for how much the building would use it's this like um it's this uh what is it it's this um light blue line here so um that was what we predicted this is what it used this blue line and we we're using eight times as much energy for these lunar months and there's a long lead time uh, for us to figure out what's going on and fix it uh, but this is where we used monitoring based commissioning we sort of asked some good questions we had the facilities manager out there a few times um, we were able to kind of adjust setbacks we were able to just be on site and see what the building's doing and, and kind of bring it in line with our predictions pretty quickly. So um, yeah, if you're looking for that year of net zero sort of compliance to be able to hit some of these certification programs, um, you know, better plan for 18 months to two years to get that right, <laughs> just in case. Uh, there's there's a lot of kinks in this process. Um, certainly, just 30 PV panels after a dust storm, you know, and you can kind of see the resultant improvement in uh, production after cleaning them. Uh, and, and just being on site and noticing these things, it's not rocket science. Um, in this case, you can see a few darker cells in the mix and they have a live feed so they can see how much each uh, PV cell is producing. Um, we were able to identify five of these that were underproducing and we got them replaced for free under the warranty period, um, you know, and then sort of got this thing back in line with the production we needed to hit our net zero targets. And it's tracking pretty close right now. But if we weren't looking at this, if we weren't asking these questions, we never would have seen it. So it's pretty simple, but it's very accessible. And every, every firm should be able to do this, you know, just with some simple tools and um, asking the right questions. So, and certainly partners as well. Um, so this is Johnston City Hall. This is a bit bigger, a bit more complex. There's a robust team lead in place. Um, definitely a full framework for design excellence project. We started from the, the beginning on this one. And um, yeah, uh, it's just a different story, right? Um, a lot more care, uh, a lot more sort of funding uh, for good site amenities and um, just more predictive analytics at the beginning in design. And I think, um, you know, just a more holistic uh, picture of sustainability. So when you, when you have the right project, you can really leverage that in a lot of different ways on that story. These are um, walnut trees that were cleared from the site and then reused in the building. And this is, I mean, this is where you interface with your town, right? In this, in this place, you want them to have a good experience when they come here. So this is really important. The quality of design is not all about efficiency. Um, but I think what we started out was really strong um, ideas about orientation, about shading, about window to wall ratio. Um, you know, these passive design strategies to knock the loads down um, that are, I think, really key to um, a comfortable building as well as a high performing one. So it's not often you get to design your town hall. So uh, this was super fun for the folks that lived in this community and were able to, you know, um, take it from a pretty modest lead silver requirement, like far beyond that in terms of uh, the design. And, and most city projects are designed bid build 
but in this case, um, we had a contractor on from day one that um, owns the building and leases it back to the city. Uh, so it was a really interesting negotiations process, um, but it was great to have them at the table. Um, made a lot of the hard decisions a lot easier because we were working with good information. Um, and then it's well loved and well used as a city stage. Certainly got a lot of um, open space, stormwater stuff. Um, <laughs> you can tell like the difference between this building and the last one. Uh, it took two months to kind of bring in line with its predictions. Um, so, you know, when you have uh, lead and, and you're looking at a more holistic picture where there's energy modeling, there's renewables, there's commissioning, there's um, all these basic requirements that are built in. Um, it turns out like you can you can get there a lot quicker. It's just it's just a great structure to have when you can get it to work. So unfortunately, like most of our buildings aren't lead. I wish more were, um, but yeah. So process and tools, uh, I'll rip through this really quick. We have a sustainability action plan that we did uh, seven years ago, and we're looking at redoing it now. So much has changed um, in terms of how the office has grown, how much we've learned, uh, but the still, the, the core is really still relevant. And, and that's what's cool looking back after all this time. We tried to make it, um, about the Midwest and contextual and where we live. So there are all these photos of prairies and uh, other stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, so we have Climate Studio and we use that for sort of conceptual energy modeling, daylight modeling, and some other tools. It's worked great for us. Um, the kids love it. <laughs> sometimes, uh, sometimes we need to kind of go back and make sure all of the uh, assumptions are right in the process. But I think um, it's been a really great conversation to have on projects and, and clients really like it too. So. Um, I keep coming back to this report that I worked on when I was uh, part of the Committee on Media Environment for AIA. It's the habits of high performance firms. And basically, um, you know, we identified 10 firms that were multiple co award winners from COPE. And uh, we went, we sent an intern and we, uh, we had her interview uh, everyone from the CEO down to the reception um, folks and kind of took their best practices and, and put them into this report. So how your firm operates and building a culture of high performance within the firm, a culture of sustainability, is um, is really, it's still relevant. And I think these firms are still doing a great job. So firms like Kieran Timberlake, um, Lake Plato, uh, you know, Letty Maynum Stacy, uh, Brooke Scarpa, small firm in there that just won uh, the firm of the year, or sorry, two gold medals, Larry and Angie. Uh, so I was over the moon to hear that. and. Obviously, they're uh, bleeding edge uh, on the design side and then getting that sustainability stuff in there too in, in a very uh, amazing, cost-effective way. So, um, yeah. Uh, I talked a little bit about the rating and um, self, you know, turning that mirror back on ourselves. The framework for design excellence is great because it's laser focused on projects but uh, thinking about how it applies to the firm and particularly where you want to build strength can help um, direct education and training. Um, it can direct uh, software purchases, um, resources like ours and um, that type of thing. Uh, so it, it really helps kind of narrow the, the focus. And for me, I think if you want a robust sustainability program, you have to do energy and right? it has to start with energy. 
because it's so fungible, right? Um, it has, um, it doesn't matter if you care about cost or the planet, you do the same thing for either one. So it's really easy to get some traction there. Get some quick wins and then think about something harder like biophilia <laughs> or um, you know, resilience or materials, which are equally as important, but somewhat more difficult to integrate. Um, in, in this diagram is another great report that we use a lot from Nine Foundations of a Healthy Building. Um, it's sort of sponsored by the T.H. Chan School uh, in Harvard, and they identified these different parts um, for a healthy building. Uh, I think it's five out of nine are air quality related. So a lot of our um, research and, and development stuff is in air quality now in the firm and the tension between energy and air quality and the sort of conversations that we're having uh, are really, really interesting. Right? And, and they're, they're actually changing how we model things. So um, initially, like we tried three systems for the HVAC, maybe, uh, you know, uh, variable air volume rooftop unit, um, and then uh, air source uh, variable refrigerant flow, and then maybe a, like a ground source heat pump on the super high performance side. And, you know, we'd be able to weigh cost and performance out pretty straightforward. But then when you start ramping up the air volume and how the systems perform, especially um, like non-peak loads, uh, th those, are, those are really telling. And they're, they're shifting the payback periods and, and having that conversation with the owner has been really good. So asking those questions, integrating your energy modeling uh, folks and your uh, HVAC engineers have been, uh, it's, it's been, uh, been good. Um, yeah, talked about the G sheet. And then just a, a few quick uh, things to kind of wrap up. Um, I would say the holistic approach is really important. So I'm passionate about energy. That's where I'm good. But um, other people might be approaching it from a healthy perspective. I guarantee you, if you're in any type of design firm, you know, talk about design first. That's going to get you the most traction. Um, and then, you know, thinking about that, uh, hitting as many areas as possible. Um, you know, 2030 has always been about increasing energy modeling. We know there's a lot of juice left to squeeze uh, out, of, out of the program there. Um, a couple of years back, we were seeing like uh, many large projects, over 100,000 square feet, not getting an energy model. And that's just wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like a fraction of a, you know, fraction of a percent to get that done. And it's such a powerful tool, not just for tracking energy and cost, but it's like a cost control tool. So uh, if, if you're not selling that energy model as a cost control tool to the owner, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, it's very valuable in that process. So um, a lot of times, you know, if something's not quantified, it, it's easily VE'd out. So that's a, that's a really important uh, leverage point. And then the economic drivers. So, uh, you know, come into sustainability as the right thing to do, but the firm needs to see the impact to its bottom line. And so we have incentives that come to us and those that go to the owner to integrate this stuff. 179D is certainly a, a big driver at our firm. We do a lot of public work so that those tax uh, deductions come to us. Uh, buck 80 square foot, now it's like signed law, so it's not going away. And then certainly we're using that R&D tax credit. Um, this is not even quantifying the squishy stuff like leadership uh, out there. So 
I think it's easy to make the financial case for a firm to invest in um, and develop these tools in house. Um, just looking back, like I think in the last five years, I found 40 projects that have integrated solar energy in them. And before that, you know, it's just like a handful. So the market has really changed. And I would say being an in-house solar estimator <laughs> and just asking that question and being able to do some quick calculations and say, yeah, it's about how much it's going to cost. And this is uh, how much roof we need. And um, this is how much it could produce. And, and, and linking that up with the energy model and, and really thinking about the opportunities in the design process and almost makes up for not having the requirement in the RFQ or RFP to be net zero. <laughs> we just, we have a lot of luck uh, in the design process um, selling that. So uh, addressing energy first is really important and then getting to carbon competency. And what I found is that um, the firms that are topping out need to shift their focus to carbon, right? The firms that are just starting, start with energy. Though that's really well known in the market and you can you know, become cog and really good really quick. Uh, but, but the carbon is new. It's almost in its research phase and folks aren't doing it consistently, but I haven't seen this level of engagement and enthusiasm in sustainability since like the early 2000s when we came out. So carbon has really taken over the conversation, uh, but I don't think a lot of people are doing it right. So um, when you look at carbon, it's different from energy. Um, it is, I think, really important to take energy efficiency, but then look at electrification, look at on-site and off-site renewables to help get us to um, you know, a lower carbon footprint. Um, and, and those are you know, just add-ons to what we're doing now. It's not rethinking the whole process. So that's, that's a really important change in the industry. So quick studies in-house, um, lots of freeware out there if, if that's what you need. Um, but certainly there's a lot of um, like really great software like Climate Studio if, if you have um, the means, I highly recommend it. Uh, put it in the drawings, right? <laughs> if it's not in the drawings, who's gonna know about it? Um, usually if we go to put something in the specs, it's to hide it. <laughs> uh, be vulnerable, so ask, to have the utility bills and then also ask not to be sued. <laughs> so there's some liability there, know the risks, but go in with an open um, relationship and, and you'll definitely um, be the wiser and, and bring more value to your client that way. Um, Post-occupancy engagement has been a huge component. Uh, you know, we developed our own um, survey. We use a lot of things like the Center for the Built Environment survey, which is great. Um, there's a newer company out there named Rework that has been super interesting and help us rate, um, rate our buildings and, and how we did. And then timing, right? <laughs> I would say there's, there's this too early, too late syndrome. Um, so when you go to talk to a team and say, hey, what are you doing for sustainability? And they're like, ah, it's too early, come back in two weeks. And then you come back in two weeks, it's like, yeah, it's too late, we already figured it out. So don't, don't let that be an excuse. Um, dig in, no matter what part you are in the process, there's always something that you can do to help kind of push things along. So I think that's it. And yeah, I would love to see you guys. Hear, hear your thoughts and yeah. Thanks very Thanks much, Tate. Sure. That was great. All right. Well, um, 
if anybody has any questions, uh, you can either post them in the chat or you can um, just like like raise your hand and uh, I can I can allow anybody to talk if you if you want to. So um, love to just hear some general feedback and also if you just have any um, any specific questions for Tate. Is there any way we can see everybody? I don't I don't know I don't think so I think I think I can just uh, it says allow them to talk hang on oh. uh no I can just allow people to talk <laughs> okay that's fine sorry I have limited limited controls so no that's cool uh let's see I think we do have a Q&A here um thanks for rescuing me uh James and Denise <laughs> so um <laughs> Okay, the first uh, first question here from James: um, the fees for the energy analysis. Are you baking in some level of modeling for all projects or handling uh, on a case uh, case by case based on available fees? Yeah, it, it really depends on the project, and uh, we are doing that. We're we're basically holding a minimum sort of amount for energy modeling on every project. It's not huge, uh, it depends on the complexity of the size of the project, but we're sure we can get at least a little bit in there. And then ultimately, if we get challenged on the fees, we'll open our books and we'll say, hey, this is best practice. You don't wanna leave this on the table. It's, it's just, uh, yeah. And we've never taken it out. So it's usually not super controversial. Yeah, and and in my experience as well, um, we um, as a consultant, we you know hire a couple of different uh, gig workers, you know, and they do they do a great job, you know. So if, if it's a quick little, you know, quick little uh, preliminary energy analysis or something, you know, that could be that could be a thousand dollars, you know what I mean? And and mm -hmm. and you could get a pretty robust ASHRAE model, you know, for. 4,000 bucks, you know, or, or less. So, um, so there's, there's definitely resources out there. It's not, I don't know. It seems like 10 years ago when I would ask, you know, our MEP firms, Hey, can you, you know, do an energy model? And they're like, Oh, that's going to be like $20,000 or, you know, like, like weeks and weeks of work. And, and, uh, it's really <laughs> doesn't have to be that crazy. Yeah. Um, one of the innovative things we've tried is to, you know, pick a consultant that we like and then go on an on-call basis. So, you know, the money's there. They're happy to hop in on any project at any and do like a quick study. Um, and if we don't use it, uh, we're just losing that money. So it behooves us to like reach out and integrate them into the team. It's worked on both sides really well. So. No, that's a great, and it's a great point. I think when, whenever a, a fee is viewed as like an add-on, <laughs> you know then then that then it means it's optional right but if it's if it, uh, it's that's kind of a deductive kind of a reasoning right like hey it's already in there if you, uh, mr owner if you don't want to if you don't want to use it we won't we won't use it however you, you know you already you already agreed to it so you may we may as well get the value out that's great um denise my friend good to good to hear from you again uh, her question is, uh, how is the concept of human equity factoring into the conversation for 20, 2030? <laughs> Not enough. Um, I could say that, um, you know, from the framework for design excellence, it, it sort of fits into this model of equitable communities. And, you know, the ways you do it, uh, accessibility is active outreach to parts of the community that maybe not have a, a voice. Um, it, you know, and, the, you know, it's mother's rooms, it's some other things that aren't quite code, but maybe aren't the full sort of community democratic um, sort of, it's been hard to see. Uh, really good physical examples, um, at least even in the code awards uh, around these ideas. So um, the jury is really good this year. I think the awards are coming out 
like they'll be announced at the end of the week um, on Earth Day. So I'm really excited to see um, those examples. Oh, it's been hard cool. for us too. Sure, yeah. I mean, if it's a really community-based project, obviously there's, you know, there's, there's more opportunities for that. And um, uh, Denise was actually my mentor at our old firm that we worked at uh, previously. And, and um, that firm was like really um, noted for doing, a, taking a really community-based approach. And so I think um, a lot of that um, equity and just, you know, comes from, from listening with an open mind and, and um, you know, looking for the, the human connections of, of design um, by, by asking the, the users and the, um, and the future occupants, you know, um, even getting kids on a design committee and ask, you know, asking them how, how, you know, how can this library be more useful to you? You know, um, how, what, what would get you to go to this library more often than, um, and, and obviously having a, a diverse group of, you know, of people engaged in the design process, you know, ages, as well as, you know, uh, race and, and background and economic, economic background and everything. I think just, just, um, for architects to actually facilitate that, um, you know, uh, and say, we, we want more feedback than just the two people on the design committee from the, from the owner side, you know, um, is, is a great way to at least, at least open that door. Don't you think to, for that, for that conversation to happen? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot of work going on in the nonprofits world right now around low income and, um, energy equity. So, uh, it's a really hard problem for architects to solve. Yep. Like there's a tremendous amount of opportunity going into existing buildings and older neighborhoods and, and doing retrofits and, um, you know, cutting folks with low income, you know, energy bills in half or more. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Denise, I wish we could talk because I think she has some pretty good ideas, <laughs> and I'd love to hear them. Yeah. Um, the question, uh, one other question I had, um, and please feel free, folks, if you want to. Um, oh, I see someone raising her hand. Hang on just one second here. Hopefully I don't mess this up. Um, okay, Lance, I think we can hear you now. So if you just unmute, there you go. Thank you. Hey, hey guys, this is Lance. Uh, great, great presentation, Tate. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, um, had a question kind of based around the, the 2030 by the numbers, right? And, you know, been looking at the, the research that comes out each year and, and just wanted to get your input on, you know, we've been growing, it's been going up, more millions of square feet are getting, you know, lower energy and more architects are getting on board, but it seems like there's a, a gap of where we probably need to be if you probably listen to, you know, Architecture 2030. Well, so what do you think it's gonna take for firms to, for the AIA, the industry, for architects and even owners to get on board and really make this, uh, trying to, being able to meet the 2030 commitment in, a, in the near future, really? Oh my gosh, yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, how much pain are you willing to endure? That's, I think is my question. Um, because, you know, a really interesting opportunity is education and training, right? Um, are we willing to sort of put a requirement on architects to get education and training dedicated to like 2030 or carbon reduction? like in the next few years when it's super important that we get this. Um, people generally hate to be told how to direct their learning, but I think we all need sort of this common baseline to, you know, um, figure these things out. So that's one simple thing we could do. In, in a way it stratifies like lead every large firm out there is committed to 2030 and maybe not making it, but tracking it. And like us, they've got a few projects that are hitting it, but for the bulk, you know, we're just not there yet. So it's, it's great to see the movement. It's great to see the large firms like committing 
what we really need to do is focus on resources for the small and, um, and medium-sized firms out there that maybe don't have the resources or computing power or staff like specialties and make this a real generalist application. I think that would go a long, long ways. Um, if I had my druthers, uh, DDX would be way more than just a tracking system, but be a lot more interactive to help us make design decisions, to uh, think about carbon in a more holistic way and in a, in a way that's like education and training, but practically applied in your day-to-day -day projects. So those are just some ideas and kind of new things on. I don't know. What, what do you think? What should we do? Well, I, I do like what you touched on with the education and training, because I believe I just read even this last week that uh, AI in California requires like five learning units a year with carbon reduction. Yeah anything so that's a great first step because now it allows everybody to have the opportunity to kind of educate themselves and, and get a feel and an understanding for it and, and then start to apply it themselves but yeah you gotta great... be careful they're gonna start sneaking over the border and taking your webinars for CPUs. <laughs> this should definitely we'll take qualify them. yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, great cool. thank you tate thank you guys um Next question. Uh, I'm going to take a wild guess that this is coming from Ethan uh, or, or uh, maybe somebody else with a with a with a uh, maybe a law background. But uh, how do you contractually deal with uh, POE? And I'm not sure exactly what um, what that acronym is. POE not being discovery for future litigation. Complex smart buildings often take a year of operation to understand and evaluate actual data against design targets. Um, that's a great question. Uh, so POE is post-occupancy engagement, post-occupancy evaluations. Okay. And, um, there's a great paper by Julie Hiramoto out there on, uh, by SOM that helps kind of identify the risks. And there's certainly, um, <laughs> It was a challenging conversation at my own firm, right? Uh, in, in a lot of ways. So the way we kind of skinned it was to like evaluate ourselves in our own offices. Um, and nobody liked that idea. Nobody likes getting measured. <laughs> nobody likes getting told they're not doing it right. But, but I think getting over that and finding out where there was value and where maybe we could close the gap a little bit, um, is is really important and i i think if you look at acoustics like 70 percent of our projects don't meet minimum acoustical standards like everybody hates them and that's something that is a fundamental component of like a healthy building so how do we elevate the acoustic concern at the beginning of the design phase how do we, you know, sort of estimate it, and then, and then, how do we measure it to verify our assumptions at the end? You know, because we don't have a lot of extra scope or fee to bring on an acoustician unless we're doing a, you know, performance arts venue. So it's it's about, um, um, I think, providing context to the owner about what the profession is able to achieve. And the idea has been around for a long time. It used to be codified in need pretty well, but they dropped the requirement in this next, in, in version four. Um, uh, ASHRAE has a really great sort of system out there that's PPD or percent predicted dissatisfied with the thermal comfort in a space. And the idea is that, you know, you're trying to hit 80% of the occupants because you're never going to make everyone um, well, the ugly truth is like 80 is really hard to hit and most of our buildings don't hit it. But what you see is in all these metrics that lead buildings generally perform better than the rest. And there are tons of studies out of the Center for Built Environments at uh, UC Berkeley that have been running these POEs um, for you know, 
gosh, it must have been like 20 years now. Um, so they've done a lot of great research. These are all subjective, um, sort of, uh, but, but they do a good way, um, benchmark themselves against this like pure set of data um, that allows you to sort of couch whatever performance you're getting. But it's also a way to get teeth, you know, um, into your into your designs, right? Uh, I want to cut cut this or cut that to be on budget. Well, these things are valuable, and you're going to see reductions in these metrics across the board if you do that. Um, yeah. <laughs> Got it. No, that's great. Um... And, and I think also we have about five more minutes. So if anybody has um, maybe maybe one one or two more questions, um, please post it in the chat or uh, raise your hand, and I'll um, I'll turn your microphone on. Um, you know, I, I think on the liability side, um, I, I think you could also argue that like um, going that extra mile with that with that client, you know, that um, from a relationship standpoint, you know, and saying that, like, hey, we really want to make sure this building's designed, you know, performing how it's designed, and um, you know, and, and it more than likely will be above code minimum, right? So, so just from a standard of care um, kind of a approach, I, I wouldn't think there's a whole lot of risk to doing, you know post-occupancy evaluations just, you know, um, ba based on the fact that, that no other firms do it. Right. So like you're, you're not really exposing yourself to a, a standard of care, um, because it's, you're not, you're not required to do a, a POE, but, um, and I think it's also kind of a good marketing as well. Right. And just, uh, you know, cementing the relationship saying that like, you know, Hey, we, we actually care about <laughs> how, how this is being used and we want to help you maybe dial it in so at least at least it's it's running more efficiently or you know maybe we can make some changes to to um you know make 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 the users the the occupants more comfortable or something um or if nothing else like you know we want to learn from this and make the next building for you or someone else better you know um so it seems like appealing to their kind of humanity you know would be at least one way to avoid getting sued <laughs> yeah, yeah. A couple, a couple of other quick ideas. Like one thing we've been super successful with is a pre-occupancy evaluation. Mm. So we'll go in, we'll set some sensors, we'll measure the space that they're currently in, and then it, it's really easy most of the time to knock that out of the park. So with a renovation or with an addition, they're using less energy than they would you know, with a smaller building. So uh, that's sometimes pretty eye-opening. The other thing is everybody's coming up to you now and going, hey, you got to do digital twins. I'm like, what are you talking about? It's just, it's just a post-occupancy evaluation. It's tying that design and occupancy um, sort of phase together and extending the life of the client. Oh, that's great. Um... Let's see, I think we had, uh, we got, got to all the questions. Um, uh, and then uh, just real quick, like uh, what, what assessment tools do you use? Um, and, uh, uh, you know, is there any, any freeware out there available to just do, you know, re really basic kind of shoebox, shoebox modeling without, without buying like a really robust, you know, like Cove tool type, type, you know, software for some of those smaller smaller firms that just want to, you know, just, just basically, you know, with, with some basic information to help establish some EUI, you know, and lighting power density, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. Uh, so there used to be a lot of little like freeware tools, like, LBNL had a bunch of stuff. Um, gosh, one of the best was Climate Consultant. I think that's still, yeah, the UCLA. Um, yeah. I think that's really still available. Cool. Yep. It's, yeah, if, if you have Java, you know, mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> you know, if, if the software hasn't run out of them yet. Um, 
we built something called uh, Back of the Envelope Calculator when I worked at the Energy Center back 10, 15 years ago. And it's basically like this simple tool with a bunch of slider bars. Mm. And there's only like 15 things that you can use to affect the performance of your building. And it was really all about like, you know, hey, what if I increase the insulation? Well, we saw a drastic therm reduction in a cold climate. Then we actually saw insulation during the, the summer where we were keeping the heat in the building. So it was like a negative payback. And, and you can sort of understand the building physics that way at a very simple level. Um, geez, SketchUp has a pre-designed tool yeah. now. Mm -hmm. uh, probably one of the best is Autodesk's, um, whatchamacallit, 360 uh, Insight. The Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're running Revit, uh, doing a, a, an insight model is pretty simple and getting getting easier every day. Um, and that's one of the best platforms out there for analyzing it. Um, geez, Autodesk just bought somebody too. I can't remember who. That's cool. And I love the idea of um, getting that visual data on the drawings, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, it's there, you can't, you know what I mean? So, so don't, uh, you know, there, there's no denying that, that we discussed it. And, you know, we set targets and, and it's on the, it's on the drawings, you know, um, I think that's awesome. Yeah. yeah, I think we initially ran into a little pushback, like, why, why do you want to expose us? <laughs> no, what if we don't hit those numbers uh -huh, like yeah. disclaimer yep. right these are you know estimates like you see on every energy modeling report yeah. that's ever been yeah. <laughs> you know it's, yeah. it's very simple uh but yeah being able to communicate that like in the trailer when they want to cut <laughs> yeah. your overhang back six feet to save <laughs> a couple hundred bucks right yeah. um it's like, well, if you do that, here's here's the impact. Mm -hmm. you know, foot candles in SDA and EUI and three other metrics. And then they're like, hey. Okay. Well, yeah, and I, and I think it's important just to just to show that that that, that analysis was considered, right? That it, it wasn't it wasn't just an, an anecdotal, you know, um, or 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 not very informed random design decision you know like no we actually we actually you know made the overhang a certain length based on based on this data so um i, th I think it does help with the ve process you know and i think i think it um again it's a it's i i think it's fairly cheap cheap marketing to be able to um make you know make make a point that that those decisions were conscious and um and that and that they were that that uh changing, changing something later during value engineering or whatever, it's, it's got, you know, like, remember, it's going to change our, change our overall energy goal. So, um, yeah. so it gives you some, gives you some, you know, some defense backup, you know, I think it's great. Yeah. Uh, I think it just shows the owner that you're, that you're, that you're aspirational as well. You know what I mean? We really want this building to, to perform, you know, so it's, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Right. Architects need to be less, you know, more aspirational anyway, you know, and, and uh, we don't get sued very often, you know, so like uh, right. we shouldn't, I don't think we should be making too many design decisions based on, you know, uh, could we possibly get sued by some jerk client? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, they say, I don't know, like if you get surgery, right, and your doctor doesn't call you back up to check on you later, that's malpractice. Right. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> Why don't we apply that to architecture? It's, right. It's, right. Yeah. Well, especially when when sustainability and you know um, carbon carbon zero design is part of our the, the AI's design ethic. You know, I mean, it is. If, if you're at least you're if you're an AI member, you know, you, that's what that's what you sign up for. So, um, yeah. you know, we're, we're we're not being negligent, <laughs> you know, by 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 doing these things. So I think that's great. I think, especially when you're starting out with these programs and these analysis, there's um, an incredible fear over accuracy, right? And 
And that's important. It's, it's important to know like what's the right context and not um, overcommit or overpromise. And a lot of eager interns, like it's, you know, it's like handing them a chainsaw. It's really <laughs> powerful and really dangerous, right? <laughs> Somebody's gonna lose a finger. Um, so, um, you know, a good QA, QC process is, is always important. Um, the most important thing I think is learning that the magnitude and the direction of your decisions. So that, is this gonna have a big effect or a small effect? And is this negative or positive and why? Um, don't worry so much about the accuracy that will come with time. Um, maybe, you know, make sure that you have that oversight before sharing, uh, but you know, in general, it's, yeah, all information is good information, even if it's bad. <laughs> well, that's great. Well, thanks. Thanks for sticking around uh, extra. I, I really, I know it's later where you're at, but uh, I really do appreciate it. And um, I want to thank everybody for, uh, for logging in and registering today. And um, again, uh, please, uh, um, let us know if, if you have any problems uh, redeeming your CEU credits. And thank you very much uh, for putting this together and um, uh, for inspiring our, our chapter here. We really do appreciate you, Tate. And please accept this uh, virtual round of, of <laughs> applause from all of us. I know it's, it's always kind of uh, anticlimactic at the end of a webinar. <laughs> I love it. Like, yeah, well, total silence. Go out there and do some great work. So thanks. All right. We'll stay in touch. Thanks again, Tate. You're awesome. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Be well.